More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern, Spirit of God my teacher be, showing the things of Christ for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. That last verse tells us that he's on the throne and we have to look forward the riches of his glory and more of his kingdom sure increase that's here and now and we believe that his kingdom is furthering even in spite of what we see happening more of his coming prince of peace let's lift it on the last more about jesus on his throne riches each glory all his own more of his kingdom sure increase more of his coming prince of peace more more about jesus more more about jesus more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me amen good singing Let's turn to number 401. Number 401, open my eyes that I may see. <clears throat> open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. This is one of the few songs in our hymnal where it's really a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Open my ears that I may hear. On the second, open my eyes that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the scriptures fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my soul, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Amen. 
Lynn Dargy, I wonder if you would lead us in prayer. Amen. <clears throat> we so need God's working in our lives, and prayer is really the, the thing that shows that we have a passion for that. I um, wanted to read to you a, um, just a note that we got from the Armstrongs. As you know, they came off the field because of Heather's health, and they're now in um, I believe it's Washington, and they are, um, he's a chaplain there. I believe he's a chaplain in a hospital, and so they're continuing to minister, I'm sure, in many ways, but just let's pray for them. Just read you their, said, Dear Pastor Hamilton, this is a few months late since we just got these cards back from, uh, from Mexico this week. But I wanted to personally thank you and uh, your church for your prayers and support. Although we returned earlier than we had planned, we praise the Lord that we were able to train pastors and replace you. At, um, I'm sorry, train pastors to replace us in both church planting and ministerial training. Thank you for the privilege of having been part of our missionary, or part of uh, letting us be part of your missionary family and for your hospitality during my last visit. Sincerely, Jason and Heather Armstrong. So uh, that was a nice note, and I know we haven't probably thought about them as much as we should, but keep praying for them. Then I got a sweet uh, note from. Uh, David Palazzola just thanking us for the gift that we gave him. It was a little over $800 that we gave him for coming and helping with all the uh, the work here. And I know he, he also helped several individuals. So thank you for your giving and generosity. That was a great encouragement. He wasn't expecting it. He came totally voluntarily and wanted to do it. But I just felt that it would have, it was a very, very nice thing to do for him covered his expenses. <clears throat> All right. Um, hopefully you got the mission or, or the um, prayer sheet for tonight. And in the, that, there were two emails. One was the mission prayer letters and the other was our different prayer request. And I just wanted to emphasize several things. Um, the Engel Hearts were one of those. They said, please... Uh, Please pray for the VBS held at the Irfa Church and <clears throat> pray for believers to grow. Um, they're involved in several building projects, so they wanted us to pray that that would go well as they add on to the churches. And then the Dodgens have moved back to um, their home place. They were with their, um, I think it was their daughter and son-in-law or their son, I think maybe it was their son and daughter-in-law. And um, now they're back home in the, where they'll continue ministering there. Um, and then the Eckerts had, had a very encouraging uh, letter. They um, 
September 8th, they had an interview at the Ecuadorian consulate for rents, um, residency. September 20th is their commissioning service. And then Thursday, September 24th, their departure flight for Ecuador. They're excited about that. And they said, please pray for these things to continue. And they just gave a series of kind of answers to prayer that led to all that, which is really encouraging. So if you haven't read that, I would certainly encourage you to read it. Let's pray that they'll arrive safely and uh, that their preparations for that trip would go well. <clears throat> also, I wanted to reiterate what I mentioned Sunday. We have had a number of gifts come in simply for um, helping victims of the windstorm. And uh, we're, again, using some of those funds here in our church, but we're also uh, open to using those for victims that you might know of that were really uh, damaged by those and might have need above and beyond their insurance. So let us know if that's the case, um, and we would be interested in doing that. Again, we, we, <coughs> we like uh, helping those with whom our, our, our uh, regular people have contact so that we, we have a relationship there, and uh, we want to see that going on. All right. If you'll take out your lessons for tonight, and we'll be using the same one that we did last week. There are extra ones back there. <laughs> Is there anyone that doesn't have one? Anybody at all? I hope there were enough back there. We usually have quite a few people that bring them back the next week if we didn't finish them. So I hope you did that. So last week we started on another one of God's attributes, his communicable attributes, and that is one of the attributes that we share or we can share and that was the attribute of wisdom. And I, I noted last week that wisdom, the Bible differentiates between wisdom and knowledge. And most people that think of wisdom see it as knowledge properly applied. Wisdom is taking the knowledge that you have and being able to wisely apply it to the circumstances of life. <clears throat> I want to just review some of the highlights of last one as we get into this. Uh, we're going to be spending our time on Roman numeral three, but one of the important things we said under number one is God's wisdom means that God always chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. That's the definition of what <coughs> biblical wisdom is, God's wisdom. So it goes, it goes further than just God knowing things. It actually covers how he does things and his decisions about what he will do are always wise decisions and they always bring about the best results. And that's one of the reasons why we can trust him with our lives and we can believe that everything he does is good. And then we must remember that God's ultimate perspective includes the best results for us as believers also, and that demands trust. We gave a lot of illustrations of that, but I'm not going to take the time to do that. And then under poignant truths, under the number one of God's wisdom in general, we read Job 12, 13. With him are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. God's wisdom and creation, we see that all around. And um, God associates his wisdom in creation with his wisdom in overseeing our lives. If he can do that, and that's part of what Job saw, 
God didn't tell him why he was doing what he did in Job's life, but he pointed him to creation. And when Job meditated on God's creation, he found himself repenting. God's wisdom, then we saw in matters of life, circumstances of life, and that's why we quote Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So we know that God is wise. And, but also in regards to the circumstances of life, relationships. God is wise in, in regards to relationships. That's why he chose the genders as he did and the roles that they have because he's all wise and we should honor that think of wisdom in parenting God was wise in putting you in the home he put you in now some now think about that for a minute. You, some of you that grew up in Christian's home, Christian homes, you would say, yes, I, I believe that. But there are those who didn't grow up in Christian homes. In fact, not only there are some who grew up in fairly good non-Christian homes, and there are others that grew up in very difficult homes. And yet, no matter who is looking at that, if you're a believer and you didn't have a good home, you have to look back and see, okay, God was preparing me for something. And you, don't, you might not know all the answers, just like Job didn't. But as a believer, you can trust God and you can thank him that he brought you to Christ. And then letter B, God's wisdom displayed in the wisest mortal man that ever lived. We, we looked at Solomon and we wondered how the wisest man that ever lived could turn away from God like he did. And we saw that that's because of pride. And he looked at himself and he said, no, I'm above what God said. I, he said, you, you shouldn't marry outside of the faith, but he did. He said, you shouldn't multiply wives, but he did. He said, don't make treaties with foreign nations, but he did. And therefore, he was putting his wisdom above God's wisdom. And whenever we do that, we're going to fall. But we learn from that. And what do we learn from that? What do we learn from that? None of us are immune. None of us are immune. We're all susceptible to that, all of us. And so that's why we need to humble ourselves before God and before his word. So let's start on Roman numeral three. And we're going to look, this is going to be primarily application now. We, we mixed a little application in Roman numeral one and two, but this is going to be primarily applicational and exhortive, and that's good for us. Let's pray. Father, we ask that in this time now that you would truly guide us, help us to take the time to weigh each of these thoughts, to weigh truth, to weigh it against our lives so that we can be wise. Give us hearts, Lord, that seek after your wisdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Roman numeral 3, verse, or letter A. Realize that you will always be dependent on God's wisdom. And that... There are two sides of that. One reason for that is because we are all sinners and God is perfect. 
The other side of that or another reason for that is that God is all wise and we are not. And therefore, we're always in need of his wisdom. And when we realize that, then we, the Bible says, we're on the path of wisdom. All, we could put it this way, all of God's wisdom is not communicable. <clears throat> he has given us everything we need in this book, and that's what the book says. Second Peter chapter 1 tells us that he has given us everything we need for godliness and life. And so he's given us what we need, but he, hasn't, he doesn't give us all wisdom. Or else he would cease to be God and you would be equal to God. We are depraved. There were, let me put it this way. If, if we had all wisdom, we would end up like Satan did. And I'm not suggesting that he had all wisdom. I'm just saying that he, but he was... Uh, probably the greatest created being that that um, God made. <clears throat> and he fell out of pride. We're sinners. We're not even in the original state that Adam and Eve were. We're born into sin. If God gave us the wisdom, all the wisdom he had, we would use it for wrong rather than good. <clears throat> we would become proud which would take us even into greater depravity. So you will never outgrow your need to listen to God's wisdom and you will always be susceptible to the world's wisdom. It's constantly there. There's, that's why the Bible says that the flesh is always in conflict with the spirit of God. And even though we would like to be free of our flesh, fleshly nature, <clears throat> we are not yet, and we will never outgrow our need to listen to God's wisdom. That's why we need to be in God's word every day. You, all, you will always need some food in order to sustain, sustain physical life, and you will always need God's wisdom in order to live a life that glorifies him. The Lord used his wisdom as leverage to humble Job. He didn't give him the nugget of knowledge that he was wanting. Lord, why? Rather, he gave him what he needed, and that was who. And what he needed was God, and he needed to trust God. And so the Lord used his wisdom and creation as leverage to humble Job's, Job's estimation of his own wisdom because he said, just give me a court. Let me go before the God Almighty and, and bring my case before him. But after he saw God and he saw how little he was, he no longer had a case. Case dismissed. You know, Job couldn't wrap his brain around the, the multiple traumas that he had sustained. The loss of wealth, the deaths of his ten children. We would be devastated over the loss of one child. But think about the loss of ten children in one day. And some of that was acts of God himself. I'm, by that, I simply mean they were acts of nature. Some of those were the plotting of man. We would struggle. Some of his servants lost their lives in those accidents. The bitterness of his wife and finally his own health. Everything seemed hopeless. And in it, if you're in pain, that even makes it worse, doesn't it? But the 
But the Bible says that his ways are past finding out and his ways are not our ways, which is really identifying that God's wisdom is different than ours. So realize that you don't have to understand it all to trust his wisdom. You do need to obey and will always be dependent on his wisdom. And then letter B, if God's wisdom is so important, then how can we acquire it? His wisdom, in, at least in part, is communicable to us. So how can we acquire it? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us, humble yourselves before God. As long as we remain in our pride, we cannot no wisdom. That's, that's where Job had to come. He was, he thought because he can't understand it, God, there's something wrong here. And he knew, Job knew he had a clear conscience with God. And that's different than a lot of Christians. But Job knew he had a clear conscience. And so on that, he could, he could be confident that it wasn't sin that he had committed in his life. And that's why he resisted the counsel of those three friends is because he knew they were wrong. But we must humble ourselves, our attitudes, admit where and when we have been acting upon worldly wisdom, as James chapter 3 and 4 tells us, because worldly wisdom leads you to James chapter 4 verse 1. It's the worldly wisdom discussion starts in James chapter 3, but when you get to James chapter 4, he says, from whence comes, come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of those lusts that war in your members? See, that's, that's what happens when we're taking on worldly wisdom, when we're acting upon worldly wisdom. And so we're to repent and seek God's forgiveness. Seek the forgiveness of, of others whom you have influenced by choosing worldly wisdom over God's wisdom. Humble yourselves. Number two, and I, if you, if you want to put a scripture for that, put down James chapter 3 and 4. Then number two, fervently ask God for wisdom and seek it without vacillating. I think in this section are some of the most important things we can learn that all of us need to take to heart. First of all, wisdom is so important that your search for it is emphasized throughout the Bible. One whole book, think about that. An entire book of the Bible is dedicated to how you can find wisdom. And it's particularly appropriate for young, the young man or the young woman as you're getting started into your um, adult life, your, those teen years. That is what Solomon said, who, the, who Solomon said the book was really targeted for. Now, anybody can learn from it. If you get saved at 40 years of age, the book of Proverbs is just as much for you as anybody else. Also, I'd like you to just look at Proverbs chapter 2. We brought this up numerous times, and I can't help but emphasize it again. Somebody quote number two on your outline, the one we're on. What does it say? Say it out loud. Okay. 
All right, good, good. So keep that in mind now. Fervently ask God for wisdom. Look at verse 2 or verse 1 of chapter 2. My son, if you receive my words, and that's my is referring to the parent, and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand. Now, in a minute, I'm going to refer to that whole verse, but I just want to make the point that it's saying that we must want it. We must search for it fervently without vacillating. And then Paul's prayer for the New Testament believers in Ephesians includes wisdom and knowing the difference between worldly wisdom and God's wisdom. Listen to Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. And that, that's after Paul has just delineated one of the most incomprehensible explanations of salvation in Scripture. And then 1 Corinthians 1.26, if you'll go there. First Corinthians 1. Now notice from verse 18 on, he's talking about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? And then he comes down to verse 26 and he, he shows God's wisdom in, in his choice of you and me. And he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. So are we the wise or the shameful? <laughs> the things that are shame. The things that are mighty or the things that are weak. We're the weak. And then the despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ who became for us wisdom. Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That was God's wisdom that he chose the weak things because now we have to look to him for our wisdom. We are not to see ourselves as wise. We're to see him as being the one. That's why the, the scriptures say, blessed is the one or blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. We have to realize that it's not in us. And then notice verse 2, or chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, if I was going to come to you with excellency of speech and wisdom, how would I come to you? How would I speak to you? Jared? I would be speaking to you in, in a very eloquent speech that I knew was trying to convince you of, of the importance of your truth. Okay. Good. Anybody else? That's true. I might be trying to impress you also with my eloquence, but even if I wasn't trying to impress you, if I'm, if I, trusting in the eloquent way or the articulation of my uh, message to bring you to Christ, 
instead of the simplicity of the gospel. And that's what, that's what he's saying here. Now, is it saying that those who preach and teach the word of God should not prepare? I don't think so. I think what it is saying is that we should prepare depending on God and prayerfully seeking God as we prepare and not in any way trying to impress people, but simply trying to, in the power of the Spirit, communicate the truth of God's word. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. And here in verse 17 is the prayer that I was talking about that Paul prayed for the Ephesians. I'll start in 16. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making, I don't cease to give uh, thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of, of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. You know, I, I know that that's almost overwhelming. There's so much in there that it's hard to keep your mind on it all. I realize that. But just think about the prayer that we as parents could pray for our children, that they may that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians says. And that would be a good prayer for us to pray for ourselves, but also for our children and for other believers, maybe New believers, especially. Colossians 1.9, which is kind of a parallel book to Ephesians. It says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? Because the world is pressing around us and we're constantly tempted to take the world's wisdom over God's wisdom. And Satan wraps his wisdom in very convincing ways. I think about, um, I, I believe we played this in, for a, um, it was a video of a Muslim who got saved uh, going to a church in his Muslim country and he, he went there as a boy and then finally when he, I think it was when he was a teenager, he actually accepted Christ eventually uh, because of his parents being against what he said, his pastor sent him over to the United States. He went to Bob Jones University, prepared for the ministry or at least um, that's what he was preparing for, came back to his home country, or he came back to another country, and there he started preaching the word, and he began planning a church, and the church was growing. But he, um, one of the things he did when he's with Bob Jones is he, after he'd been in um, ministerial training, he changed to a business major. And so when he got over to the country where he started planning the church, he, 
he then thought, you know, I, I, I'd like to try some of these biz business ventures. And that's not to say business is wrong, but it was wrong for him because it was distracting him and eventually it caught his heart and he started giving all his time to that and um, he got into financial difficulties because he was in a great deal of debt. He couldn't pay his creditors and he was thrown in, in prison for a while. And he was there for a period of time and when he got out, he, he started witnessing again but then he got off track a little bit more and got into problems and finally he just laid it all on the altar and he and he followed the Lord's call and the point is is he was listening rather than uh, listening to God he was listening to the flesh and it truly distracted him Then, number three, and this is a very important one, know the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. And then Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I... This really isn't in the notes at all, but I, as I was thinking about this for tonight, I was thinking, I really believe that a lack of the fear of the Lord is at the heart of the problems of many Christians. We are to fear God. And yes, it, there is a reverence there, and that's, as a believer, we know that we're no longer under the condemnation of God, but we are to fear him and love him. And the more you know of God, the more you will fear him, just like Job did. And a fear of the Lord is really the answer to the opposite of that. Many people do not grow in wisdom because they fear man and man's rejection more than God's favor. And we will not really grow in wisdom until we are willing to be fools for Christ's sake. We have to be willing to be fools for Christ, not only in the world, but also among carnal believers. And I think that's that's probably the hardest place for us to stand. Caleb and Joshua had to be willing to stand up for God's wisdom in the face of the other ten spies. They, were the, they, weren't, they weren't the majority, they were the minority. And they had to be willing to do that even in the face of death. Otherwise, they would have been capitulating to the wisdom of man. And the two opposing deterrents to the fear of the Lord are the fear of man and the fear of death. Do you remember when the Lord had to deal with those two things with the disciples? Do you remember where he, where, where was that? Does anybody remember what chapter of the New Testament it's in? I mean, he spent a long time saying, don't fear. Matthew chapter 10. Let me have you turn there.
starting in verse 16. This is the Lord training his disciples. This is the Lord discipling his disciples. He was, he was getting them ready for when he would leave three years later. He had three years to do it. Now, if you're discipling your children, this ought to be part of the training process. This ought to be part of our training as believers. And I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding about that. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Is that a good description of today? Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are sobering verses, but those are the word of God. And so God, Jesus Christ, is teaching us through this passage that we're not to fear man and we're not to fear death. We're to look to him, and it's by his spirit. So, as the foes multiply against Christianity, we must be ready to stand firmly. Kind of like Meshach and Abednego, Shadrach, and when they were told, if you don't, bow down to this image, then you will be thrown into the furnace. And they said, we're not going to bow down if you throw us. We believe the Lord's going to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down.
I think of Daniel. Daniel was not thrown into the fiery furnace, but he confronted Nebuchadnezzar with his pride. And then he confronted his son with his pride. And later, Nebuchadnezzar bowed to his feet and thanked him for not giving in. I think it does us well to once in a while read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs and see what other people have gone through. And we hear of things even today. And I'm sure in each of our hearts, we wondered, would I be willing to do that? So know the fear of the Lord. Four, know and obey God's word. Now, do you remember what the rest of that verse was in Proverbs 2, verse 5? He says, if you will seek after wisdom, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And if you will seek my wisdom, and you find God's wisdom in his word. Listen to Psalm 19, 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. It's, it's addressing kings. And one of the things that he says in there that a king was supposed to do is he was supposed to have uh, a copy of of the law made for him so that he could read it all the time. He could read it every day. So he would have wisdom to lead the country, to lead the nation of Israel. That's one of the things God inspired Moses to write down for the kings. Now, it's interesting that he wrote that because that was before the people asked for a king, but God knew that someday they would. So that was in Deuteronomy, and it was in the book of 1 Samuel that we had the people asking and requesting a king. And then in Psalm 1, he says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And as a result, that's right. So, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Now, what it's describing there is a person who's prospering because he's wise. He's wise in God's wisdom. He's prospering spiritually. He's prospering in the eternal things and the most important things of life. It's, it, it doesn't... He may prosper financially, but he's going to prosper in all the things that are of utmost importance. Now, think about this for a minute. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In the context of what we're talking about, what is the counsel of the ungodly? Yes, the world's wisdom, the wisdom of man. Do you see the contrast? Blessed is a man that doesn't seek the worldly wisdom. He'll find it, especially if he's walking with fools and if he's walking with the worldly wise. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And if he delights in that, he's going to walk with those who delight in that, seeking counsel. 
And because of that, he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Psalm 12, 112, verse 1, it says, Blessed is a man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. And I just want to note the association there. We just talked about the fear of the Lord. He says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights in greatly in his commandments. And so those two go together. When you delight, well, let me put it this way. Which comes first, delighting or meditating? And I, I really had to dwell on that for a while. You know what, you know what prompted me to meditate in God's word? When I what? I still didn't hear it. Delighting in the Lord. You delighted in God's word and that makes you want to meditate in God's word. Those of you that know my testimony, why did I delight in God's word? I mean, what made me want to go to it? Do you remember? Yeah, but what did he say to me? Well, he quoted to me Psalm 1. And he said, Terry, if you'll do this, you'll be like that tree. And God will prosper you. And at the I wasn't thinking riches. I was just thinking, I need help. That's what prompted me to go to the word of God. And I... I thought, I thought, okay, this is the treasure I need to help me do what I do. Now, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is it, it would be kind of hard. It's kind of like saying which came first, the chicken or the egg. Now, we know by creation what that is, but one feeds the other. And if we can get it into our hearts, and oftentimes we don't delight in the word of God until we have such a deep need that we're willing to do what it takes. And then we start searching it, looking for the answers. I've had people come to me before where a friend has asked them some hard question and they hadn't been really taking a great deal of interest in the word of God and it's an unsafe friend. And they might have even been reading it on a daily basis, but it's kind of dull and but then this friend started asking him these hard to answer questions and because they weren't listening before, now they started saying, man, I better find out the answers to these. And for the first time, they start going to the word of God with the idea, Lord, give me what I need to answer this person. And all I'm saying is that delighting in it, there, there's a need that we have that sends us there and when we go with a hunger for it, you'll find something. Because God has said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find it. And I can't say that all my motivations were pure even in going into the... I just thought, man, if that's the case, then God is my answer. But when I started doing it, I found out that the Lord really is the answer. That the Lord is, is the delight of life. And that in him are truly hidden all the treasures of wisdom. So all I'm, all I'm trying to encourage us here on is the fact that, first of all, do we even delight in the word of God? Is it just kind of an empty ritual we go through? And I, I think habits are good, but I also think that we need to make sure that we're, we haven't lost our first love and we're hungry and we, we realize how needy we are.
the fear of the Lord and delighting in God's word go hand in hand. And the more you fear the Lord, the more you'll delight and see your own needs. And you really can't have one without the other because they both feed on each other. So if you don't delight in it, you'll probably study kind of superficially. And if you don't meditate, you will not have a passion for the things of God. You'll not, you'll not really get much out of it. So if you come to the Bible with great delight, usually there's something that has prompted you to see that need. He's prompted in the Holy Spirit you're, you're hearing the message from the word of God. Listen, how else can we explain how a human soul that is depraved can seek God? How else can you explain that? It's the light of God piercing our hearts. And it's powerful. You know, I, I don't know, but probably, probably several times as I was growing up, the, the two pastors that I had been under in my lifetime up to that point, they were godly men. They probably mentioned meditation at some point. I'm not sure about that, but I, it's hard for me to imagine them not mentioning it. But I never heard it. But two people, it was my brother and his father-in-law, mentioned it to me. And they came and talked to me personally about it. And a lot of times that makes a difference. And that put a flame. It, it, it made me see my neediness. Part of it was people that cared. And part of it was... Those people that cared made it help me to see how important it was if I was going to grow and know God. So only by the word and the indwelling Holy Spirit can we discern between God's wisdom and demonic wisdom. Demonic wisdom is earthly, it's sensual. And Satan will twist and pervert God's word so it means something it doesn't mean. That's why we need to be in God's word. Because if day to day you can go without the word of God, you're leaning on your own wisdom. That's just the way it is. And it's like saying to God, I can make it on my own. Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness and he used the word of God to do it. And if you don't know the word of God, you will not be able to hear and understand and perceive when the word of God is being twisted and perverted. Peter was convinced that the cross was a roadblock to Jesus being king. I don't like to normally call out names, but I... I'm, because this has been so much in the news, I'm going to mention it, and that has been the matter of Jerry Falwell Jr. And I know many of you have, have read about what all has happened there. But one of the things that he said early on, and, and the board knew about these things, they knew that there were questionable things going on, and they came and talked to him about it, and he said, well, I'm not the spiritual leader on this campus. That's why we have uh, campus pastors. He said, I'm a lawyer. I've been trained in that. I'm not, I don't want people coming to me for spiritual leadership. That is a person who has been deceived. And that is a person who is excusing their sin.
But again, we are all susceptible. I don't know. I don't know what his spiritual condition is as far as saved or unsaved. I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just simply saying, because we've already seen Solomon. We believe Solomon was, was a believer, but he fell into very wicked sin. So we need to all take note. But I want us to see that that man was separating Christianity from the rest of his life. What he was doing was wrong. And he did not, but he didn't, he didn't see it as wrong. And we need to be careful. We can convince ourselves that we're doing right when in fact we're doing wrong. The Bible says in the end times, if it were possible, even the elect will be deceived. So there's, there's many things that we can justify in our lives. There are many ways to engraft God's word into our soul. There's personal worship and memorization. Just let me say this, and I am in no way minimizing what we all need to be involved in a local church. But I want to say this, that the most foundational part of your spiritual life is your daily time in the word of God and in, in the worship of God. That is what will sustain you through the circumstances of life. You come to church and you, you use your spiritual gifts in service and you hear the preaching of the word of God and you hear the teaching in Sunday school. Children hear that teaching. But that's Sunday and Wednesday. You need to be in the word of God daily because you're tempted daily. And you need to be engrafting God's word into your life daily because the deceiver is very deceptive. And if you're not doing that, then you're admitting, you're acknowledging your naivete and your foolishness. So there's preaching and teaching, there's personal worship and memorization and meditation, there's singing. The Bible says, um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And by the way, that, that only emphasizes the reason why our music needs to be godly music. It needs to be doctrinally sound, and it should not smack of the world. Because Satan knows that certain musical styles support worldly lifestyle. We can use commentaries. We can use devotional books. We can use biographies of godly men. And all of those are good. They're not as good as the word of God, but those are all things that will support and add to our knowledge of the word of God. It's a way of gleaning wisdom. <laughs> and then lastly, and I'll, I'll end with this, apply God's word in all areas of your life. Let's, can we all quote 1 Corinthians 10.31 together? Can we do that? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So even drinking and eating, we can either glorify God or not glorify God. 
We cannot separate any area of our life from the Lordship of Jesus Christ. God is not as interested in what you experience in life as he is your response to what you experience in life. And by that, I'm not saying that he doesn't care about what you're going through. He does. But he also cares about what we learn. And so, remember that. The thing that he is most interested in is how we respond to the circumstances of life. Because he brings circumstances into our life to sanctify us, to grow us, to change us into his image. And your response to what God brings into your life will reflect your faith or unbelief. What does faith in God mean? Faith in God simply means that you are trusting in his wisdom, the wisdom that he has given you in his word, rather than in worldly wisdom, your wisdom, or the wisdom of the ungodly, as Psalm 1 says which is misguided by one's own depravity and lust and pleasure and the fear of man and the pride of life and so forth. So the ultimate end of all human wisdom will be sorrow. This is why salvation is so hard for unbelievers to understand because it goes against our wisdom. It goes against our natural wisdom. Calling myself a sinner? Saying that I deserve hell? I've, I've seen people just kind of stutter over that. I mean, you know, they say, yes, I want salvation. And then you, you have them, you kind of tell them uh, what the Bible says about it all. And, and then when they pray, they, they, they can't even say those words. See, consecration of my life to him is it's a very sobering thing. And I'm not my own, but I, want, but I want to live my life my way. The fact is that our life is a falsehood. Because the Bible says, what do you have that you did not receive? I said that was the last one. I thought it was. There's one more. It's very short. Be not afraid, but be courageous. <coughs> Joshua 1, 7 and 9, it says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. When you begin meditating on God's word and God is showing you things, you need courage to carry it out. That's why you need the fear of God. So that you won't turn to the right hand or to the left of man for what man's wisdom. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When you are standing on his wisdom, the Lord is with you. There's a reason why those who delight in God's wisdom and meditate on it must be courageous because it goes against the culture. When you fear the Lord and obey his word, there will be resistance from those who are listening to the wisdom of the world. They will try to convince you that you are foolish, radical, and extreme, just like Mr. Worldly Wisdom did in Pilgrim's Progress. They'll pr try to push you into their mold because they're not living cons consecrated lives to God. And we're not to be proud, but we are to be confident if it's God's word. We're to be confident standing on God's word and we're to be loving about what you believe and do. I'll close with this verse, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. It says, watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I don't know if you can say it better than that. If you have God's wisdom, you'll need to be brave. Let's bow in prayer. 
Father, help us to remember these things. Help us to meditate on these things. Oh, Father, I pray that you would put courage into our souls by the word of God. Help us not to fear man and help us not to fear death. Help us to look up to you, the one who sits on the throne, the one who is the most courageous. He has the print of the nails in his hands and in his feet, and he laid down his life for his own. He wasn't afraid. He confronted those that were wrong, and he had mercy and compassion on those who were seeking, and they were bowed down and hurting. Lord, we thank you for your compassion, and we thank you, Lord, for your reproofs, and I pray that you will give us such a hunger for your wisdom, that we seek it daily at your feet. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.